Hyatt, the editorial page editor here at The Post. Um, we're fortunate to have Wendy Sherman, um, former Under Secretary of State, and um, uh, <clears throat> Malcolm is a former na Naval Intelligence Officer, Malcolm Nance, and author and expert on um, the encroachments of authoritarianism into our society, and Brookings Institution Senior Fellow and Washington Post contributing columnist, Robert Kagan. Um, <clears throat> Thank you all for coming. Really Good appreciate it. Let me start with you, Wendy, um, because you were a senior diplomat uh, during the last administration, traveling the world. And so I'm sure you heard frequently the Chinese argument that authoritarianism works better. And um, you know they're building high-speed rail. We're giving up after spending a few billion dollars somewhere in Fresno. Um, <laughs> uh, and how, how attractive is that in the world? And how true is it? Well, first of all, it's terrific to be here with you, Fred, and to be here with Malcolm and, and with Bob. Uh, first of all, I think Bob wrote a brilliant essay. And the reason that it, it's an important essay is that it helps us understand that what we are experiencing now is not brand new and it's not specific to the United States, uh, that this phenomena of liberal democracies clash with authoritarianism is happening all over the world. It's why we have Brexit, Theresa May just asking for a three-month extension in hopes of getting something done. Uh, it's why we have a lot of dissension around the world. And although the Chinese, as you say, say that, yes, indeed, uh, we can get better transportation, uh, we can reduce poverty in our country, which they have done, as you well know. Uh, nonetheless, it is authoritarianism for whom? It certainly isn't the consent of the governed, which is part of our constitution and part of our declaration. It's certainly not about human rights, because we know Uyghurs are tremendously, dis not only disenfranchised, but uh, undergo horrors uh, in China. Uh, we know that it may not be a system that is sustainable over time except without big control. But I think the, one of the big points in Bob's essay that's very important is China is now going to be the owner of so much data about its people, so much control through the internet, so much control through technology, that one of the great uh, really challenges we all have is wrapping our arms around technology because technology has been part of the disenfranchisement of people, of folks feeling like they don't get their fair share of the world. And we need to master that and make sure that technology is used as a democratic tool, not as a totalitarian tool. Um, I, I think that's a huge point and I want to come back to it. Um, but I want to take a slightly different aspect on technology and ask you a question, Bob. Um, I think a lot of people assumed, I certainly did, that authoritarians could take their country up to a certain point, uh, to middle income. They could, Stalin could wrench them out of uh, agriculture into building big steel factories. But at some point, if you wanted to really become a modern, prosperous country, you had to have you needed a rule of law. You needed to let your university students express their creativity. You needed, people need to talk to each other and have newspapers. <laughs> um, was that wrong? Or is it, was it right, but now it's wrong because somehow technology has changed the equation and allowed China to be both totalitarian and prosperous? I mean, I think, as, I think it was Ho Chi Minh who said about the French Revolution, it's too soon to tell. <laughs> um, I, I don't know whether we know yet. Mm -hmm. The only thing that we can be confident of is that expectations that, for instance, in China, which we had, I think, ever since the sort of opening uh, that Deng Xiaoping led, we assumed that this opening would, uh, the, the sort of interaction between politics and economics would gradually open up China. And, and eventually that may be true, but what we've seen actually has, has not confirmed that 
that judgment. And China has moved up the ladder of production uh, very successfully. Uh, they clearly have some of the best minds in the world working. They are competing with us on artificial intelligence very effectively in what is an increasingly closed political system. I mean, Xi Jinping has moved things in the other direction. So the only thing I can be confident of is that the faith that we used to have, the sort of iron law that we believed existed uh, in the relationship between liberal politics and liberal economics is, is something that we can't have any faith in right now. Whether it eventually proves true, we just, we'll just, we'll find out. Mm -hmm. But don't count on it as an inevitable process. Well, and the other question, of course, is what happens in the interim? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it may be that 100 years from now it will prove true, but what happens in those 100 years if, if we have an increasingly uh, powerful, including economically powerful and technologically powerful China still run by a very rigid uh, mm -hmm. kind of autocracy? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Still on the technology piece, then. I mean, I, th I think a lot of us also assumed and had a lot of wrong assumptions, obviously, that the internet was going to be a force for freedom uh, and would undermine dictators. Um, now, as Bob described in this article, it's it's uh, being used for the perfection of dictatorship, and uh, every authoritarian government. Has or may have aspirations to use social media to become a totalitarian government. Is that an inevitable process? How can, is it still possible that technology could be a force for good? Uh, and, and how do you push back against that? That's, that's or, or shall I start with a uh, hard, hard question? <laughs> question. <laughs> no, I think that's an excellent question. And, and, and the phrase there is force for good. Uh, when, when Facebook and social media organizations like Twitter started out, they didn't intend to be evil, right? But then again, you know, gunpowder wasn't intended to be evil either. Uh, it just moved that way until it, you know, perfected itself in dynamite and bullets. You know, social media, as it was launched in those first waves in the Middle East, in the revolution in Tunisia in 2010 and 2011, and in, in Egypt where Facebook and Twitter were these you know, uh, you know, organizational and, and, and information dissemination tools which allowed, you know, people who wanted democracy, who wanted to spread the word of freedom and collectivize, was really, really powerful. You know, and as you say, dictators, you know, they're not fools. They pay attention to this as well. And in these dictatorships, they also saw that they themselves could identify all of their foes right down to the individual or their opponents down to the individual. They could manipulate information to the point where, uh, as we saw in the 2016 election, we saw organizations marionetting, as we call it in the, in the cyber warfare community, where, where fake entities were actually pulling the puppet strings of individuals and making them organize for a purpose that they didn't intend to. So, and they had no idea who was They had no it. idea who was pulling the puppet strings. I actually had an assassination, what we call an assassination bot, come after myself and MSNBC's host Joy Reid uh, and pretend to be a U.S. citizen in Denver in, on an internet forum in San Diego claiming that they should come to Pasadena to watch us be killed. But it originated in St. Petersburg, Russia, when all was said and done. Autocrats, as you say, and dictators, they know how to manipulate information. They know how to use intelligence, and they know how to break the, the will of individuals. And though we've taken this technology to express ourselves, the freedom of speech itself is now a weapon system in the cyber war. It is no different than a cruise missile to, certain, uh, to a certain extent. And it's the battle damage effects, as we would call it in real warfare, are that it smashes the psyche. Uh, in 2016, you know, it wasn't the Democratic National Committee that was hacked. It was the mindset of the American public mm -hmm. to the point where people who saw these platforms as hammers and anvils managed to forge a new alternate reality for one third of the population of the United States. And it has proven durable. <laughs> 
<clears throat> so how can we defend against that? Well, for the most part, I think, you know, organizations like the Washington Post, transparency and, and awareness is easily the most, is the best anesthetic for this and, 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 and the best way to wipe up this mess. But then you have an adaptive enemy who's going to take that technology and move around. We've seen the Russians, for example, have moved away from bots in this election cycle to humans to where they have tasked out teams who will take that internet and actually interact on a real time. Uh, so, so um, let me pick up on that sure. um, and talk about the response to the cyber war. Um, our awareness of this started while you were still in office. Mm -hmm. um, of course, I think the answer that the best defense is to subscribe to the Washington Post <laughs> is very wise. Uh, <laughs> but <clears throat> beyond that, um, are we, what would we be doing now if we were responding as actively as we should? Um, maybe we are, and, and what's, what defense is there? I think there's a whole cast of things that we ought to be doing, and let me say in full disclosure, I do some work for one of the technology companies that's trying to create cyber norms around the world. I think that the Obama administration, certainly the Trump administration, which seems to not be focused on this except by setting up a new command structure, but not really setting the rules of the road for cyber, those rules of the road are quite critical. I think we need to start with civic education in our classrooms. Uh, we just heard General Allen talk about the importance of the Constitution and the Declaration. There's a reason why Hamilton the musical was so popular mm. because it made real for people the possibility and the optimism and the, the trajectory of who we are and what we are about. People are hungry for that. So I believe in civic education, cyber education, good cyber hygiene, knowing what we do to protect ourselves, what we expect of our governments in terms of creating cyber norms and living by them. Working in alliances, I know that's a strange concept these days, to actually work with our friends and partners around the world to tackle these issues, uh, but it does help us get to the right place. Uh, one of the, I now, as I said to you, Fred, teach uh, at uh, Harvard. I'm director of the Center for Public Leadership, and we're trying to get young people to understand what it means to be an effective, principled public leader. Uh, and cyber and technology and the right use of technology is certainly part of that. Uh, one last point, uh, Chris Robichaud, who teaches about ethics at Harvard Kennedy School, uh, wrote a piece some time ago about how liberal democracy needs a salesman. Uh, and if you go back to the declaration, which the general was talking about, it says, we hold these truths to be self-evident. And we need to remember that we believe these truths are self-evident, and we need to claim them and fight for them and make sure that we fight on behalf of all of the people in our country, not just the 1%. Mm -hmm. um, on the response, uh, I think part of the message of your essay, as I read it, is um, these liberal values haven't always been self-evident to everybody, and it kind of goes waxes and wanes, and um, there have been other periods when people lost confidence in them. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't offer much of a, well, how are we going to get out of that, or how could it turn around? I mean, I guess last time was World War II, but uh, after a couple decades of lack of confidence. How, um, how would a more confident country, or confident in its liberal values, be responding now? And do you see any possibility of, how do you regain that momentum? Well, you'll, I, I wrote 10,000 words. I could have written another 10,000 words on maybe trying to come up with some answers. But um, we'll, we'll take a vote on that. At the uh, end yeah, of the sure. Panel. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I think, and I don't, I don't think there is one answer. I think, you know, restoring some understanding, which I think the younger generation does understand that they are been bombarded with fake news. And I think that, you know, I think more young people are looking to the Washington Post and other sort of responsible and careful media and, and understanding the difference between that and what they're getting. But I actually think it would be, we need to have another uh, real uh, national discussion about 
liberalism, the liberal values. I don't mean liberalism, left and right liberalism, I mean the liberal values that are in the, uh, in the Declaration of Independence. Because, uh, you know, I think on the one hand we say, well, uh, that's just right and we don't have to think about it, or I don't like it, it you know, I, I prefer socialism or whatever people right. prefer. Right. But I think we need to have an honest conversation about liberalism precisely because mm -hmm. it isn't in a way self-evident um, and it hasn't been historically self-evident and liberalism is about trade-offs. You know, we, there are things lost, you know, it is sort of two cheers for liberalism. And then I think we need to sort of have an honest conversation of what values are we, what are we elevating over other things? So do we care about individual rights as the primary goal of our government or, are, or do we care about other things or do we admit what's lost when you only focus on individual rights? I think we have to have that honest conversation again. We've taken a lot for granted. The Cold War was a very, it wasn't a simple thing, there were a lot of arguments, but communism, democracy, that seemed nice and simple. Mm -hmm. This is more complicated. Mm -hmm. There are weaknesses about liberalism. Authoritarians and are exploiting those weaknesses, and liberalism itself is questioning uh, uh, you know, whether it is a viable, and so we need to have that discussion. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I know I'm gonna get hammered for this because I spent my entire career as an intelligence warfighter. Right, that's in the armed forces and working in the shadows. You know, we are at a point where I'm afraid to say, and I'm gonna sound much like Robert Kagan when I'm done here, that it's time for a second Cold War. I'm afraid to say that democracy must be defended right now. We have been under attack and now we have that attack occurring within our own institutions, coming from, I'm sorry to say it, our own White House is now attacking the 243-year tradition that has maintained the balance, is attacking everything that has been built since the end of World War II, the entire Atlantic Alliance, the trade and, 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 and treaties that we've had established that have established some semblance of stability throughout the world. And it's being done at the behest of a dictator uh, you know, who was an ex-KGB colonel. Well, I know how that works. I mean, it would like making me president, right? There'd be spy operations every day, all day. And he understands the power of harnessing information and turning that into a weapon system. Everything we're seeing, even though it comes from the Russian Federation, is really a product of the Soviet era KGB. So are we fighting back? And if not, no. why, why not? The Washington Post is further on the front lines of this battle, this battle area than any U.S. government institution. Why? 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 Because information is being used as power. The greatest weapon that's being used in this administration is the suppression and manipulation of that information which would empower us to defend ourselves. We are literally putting down our sword. The next president, whoever it is, and I, and I challenge the Democratic nominees who are coming for president, they're going to have to enunciate their position on the defense of the Constitution as it exists, as it has always existed. Not just going back to the norms, anyone can go back to the norms, but are we going to confront the threat that's before our eyes? You know, it, people say, oh, you wanna have a nuclear war. No, I want a war where the foundations of democracy and, the, and what happened in the 2016 election is punished mm. and shown that the United States and its allies will never allow this to happen again. Let, let me... Um... <clears throat> Turn to you, Wendy, picking up from that. Um, and I, I should mention we did invite uh, John Bolton to be on this panel. Um, I filled it. <laughs> uh, Old John Bolton. <laughs> and, uh, that would have been fun. Yeah. Um, <laughs> next time, I hope. Um, uh, we're always open to full discussion. But I have a question uh, from a reader, uh, David, who asked, would you be willing to indicate whether you feel Trump fits the authoritarian mold? And if not, why not? Um, let me throw that one to you and, all, and append to it, you know, what hopes do you have that 2020, I mean the campaign, not the result necessarily, will include a discussion of these issues? Do you see anybody on the Democratic Party side who you think is willing to lead um, in defense of liberal values? 
Uh, I'll start at the other side. I think there are a number of candidates who are running who will defend democracy in the way that Malcolm just laid it out and that got applause from this audience. Uh, I think that um, uh, Madeleine Albright, who's a dear friend, a business partner, my former boss, uh, wrote a book recently called Fascism, mm -hmm. A Warning. And she has said repeatedly that although she does not consider Donald Trump a fascist, he is the least democratic president we have ever had. And I certainly endorse that position. Uh, we, I think one of the things we all need to understand, although I agree with what my colleagues have said here today, is that people in our country, because technology has moved so fast and because there is so much social change, uh, one of the other, uh, one of my colleagues at Harvard, Pippa Norris, has written about the cultural backlash. A lot of what's going on is that people, and I'll say that 55-year-old white guy in the middle of our country, and I've been married to a white guy for 39 years, so I love you all, <laughs> but, but he feels his, his privilege, his power has been lost. He has lost his manufacturing job to technology more than trade. Uh, the people down the street who he liked a lot, now they can get married, he doesn't know what that's about. He never wanted his wife to work, even though I believe women should have whatever choice they want. Uh, so he feels dislocated, unmoored. That sense of dislocation, of disruption, uh, is what Donald Trump has preyed upon, is what he has grabbed and said, I understand your rage, uh, and I'm going to stand with you. And even though change, as Bob pointed out in his historical essay, mm. comes with life and comes with history, disruption is necessary. The Industrial Revolution was critical to our economy and our growth. Destruction is what we are seeing now, the kind of destruction that Malcolm was talking about a moment ago. And we cannot stand for that, or we will lose the strength of our democracy. Mm. So, I mean, you, you write that uh, authoritarianism has an appeal uh, to people who are feeling that loss uh, that Wendy's talking about of tribe, race, religion, family, and that liberal, liberal democracy has no answer to that um, or for them. Is that, does that have to be true? Is, it, is, is there no way that a liberal democracy can take those communities needs into account and still respect individual rights? No, I mean, it, it's probably too stark to say that liberal democracy has no answer to it because we've obviously had long periods where, you know, tradition, including religious tradition and liberal democracy have coexisted uh, and never in any place better than in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, but there is, there, is, uh, there is intention and I think the tension is inevitable because what we're talking about is the expansion of individual rights. Uh, we, we expanded it in the 19th century as a result of the Civil War and there have been continual expansion ever since. And when there is that expansion, there are people who are going to feel uh, that th they, that is not what they want. That's not the country they think they want. And this is happening uh, all around the world. And, you know, I think that when, obviously, when times are most stressful, well, because of an economic crisis or in the case of Europe, because of an immigration uh, in, in flux, and this happened in the United States periodically in the 1920s, for instance, uh, that is the time when, when people most react against liberalism. Uh, in, in better times, the, the accommodations get made more easily. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of factors uh, going into this. Uh, in the case of the United States, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't think presidents, uh, I don't think Donald Trump created this world. He benefited from it. He, he, he's, been, he's playing on it. But a president does set a tone. Uh, and a president is the one that can articulate uh, principles and remind Americans uh, what matters. And most of our presidents confronted with these kinds of passions and pressures have worked to tamp them down, mm -hmm. not to inflame them. Uh, I think what makes uh, Trump special as a president is that he, he tries to inflame them. He's a beneficiary of them. Mm -hmm. And so I do think that almost any other possible candidate in either party mm -hmm. is more likely to try to, to try to control them because that's the way presidents generally feel their responsibility is to keep these things under control. So I do, I, I do hope if we, 
ever get another president that... Um, uh, <laughs> uh, not, not funny. That's not Sorry. Funny. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that will um, get a different tone in the White House. <laughs> um, I, I want to ask uh, about an aspect of the rise of authoritarianism that we feel sort of personally here, which is they're reaching beyond their borders, not just in cyber, but actual physically. Um, Putin uh, sending, using poison gas in Salisbury, England. Um, the Chinese kidnapping Guy Minh Hai from Thailand, and he's still missing he's somewhere in the prison system in China. And of course, uh, Jamal Khashoggi, our, um, our colleague, uh, being lured to a consulate in Istanbul and murdered, uh, and still no accountability for that. What, uh, what do you think of the West's response to these events, uh, and what should it be? It's pretty simple. The guardrail of democracy, the United States and its alliances around the world, has been removed. We have, a, and I, you know, I'll go right at the president, don't worry about it. <laughs> We have a president who has decided that the United States needs to be part of an axis of autocracies and not a part of a democracy. He wants to remove all of the defensive systems because he thinks that they're antiquated or they don't benefit him personally. Okay? By doing that, he has rung the alarm bell. He has given a permission slip to every totalitarian nation in the world to do as you please. All right. Uh, the, the abduction, murder and or, of, of Jamal Khashoggi is insane. It would never have occurred under any other president because they know, the Saudis know, and I've lived in that part of the world my entire life. I've been to their diwans. I hang out with these guys, drink with them. And they know that there are two parts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, after prayers. Okay. <laughs> so they do know that a president of the United States would put his foot down and bring the entire burden of American power on top of them, would offer sanctions, would do anything to ensure that that human right violation would A, never happen, B, not happen a second time if it does happen, and C, ensure that there was some sanction related to that, taking away some of their toys. This president has shown that he is open for sale and that you can A, do what you want because we are not going to stop you. The attack in, in, in England, the, the chemical weapons terrorist attack, which was carried out by a, what we call a class one terrorist group, a state intelligence agency designed to kill two individuals, but sickened over three, you know, two dozen, uh, was literally a terrorist attack carried out in the middle of one of our allies. We're finding they're using state level poisons, yeah. radioactive isotopes, to kill their allies in our nations. This is why I'm saying it might be beneficial or it may have to happen that we have a second Cold War, where the intelligence community will now start confronting these activities on an international scale, the way it was in the 1960s, to put them back on notice that the United States will not be pushed and we will not allow these activities to occur again. Um. To wage a Cold War like that, presumably you would need a lot of popular support. Um, you worked for a president who, well, um, I, I won't go into comparisons, but he talked about it's time for nation building at home. Popular consensus that yes, we need to be leaders, yes, we need to be giving foreign aid. Uh, where does that come from? I think you can because I think that one of the things that people did understand out of the 2008 recession is that we're connected to the world, that we don't live on an island even though we are buffeted by two big oceans and certainly 9-11 proved that our oceans do not keep us secure. We are connected to the world and I think that whoever becomes president next, and I'm hopeful there will be a new president <laughs> in 2020 because uh, I think there's a lot of talent out there, um, that that president uh, not only elevates the values that we've been talking about here this morning, but helps people understand that our government is going to support those people who feel left out and left behind, that we are going to create a safety net for those folks, that all boats can rise, 
there, there are ways to move life forward where, yes, there will be trade-offs, no doubt. Bob is right about that. But we can manage those trade-offs. We can soften the um, impact, the negative impacts of those trade-offs, and that we are going to be out in the world as we lead. When I was undersecretary, I traveled to, I don't know, maybe 60 different countries while in the four years I was undersecretary. I've traveled constantly since. Everywhere I have gone, people have said, we need the United States to lead. We will do our part, mm. but we need you to lead. And it's because no one, even today, has the economic power that we do, the military power we do, and most fundamentally, the commitment to freedom and to democracy that we do. And even when people don't like what we do, they hope for us anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, and we need to return to that. Mm -hmm. That's uh, very well stated. Um, and we are basically out of time. Let me do a 20 second lightning round. We have one more reader question, which I wanted to ask from Bob. Uh, different Bob, I assume. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what can we do on a what can we do on a daily basis in the lives we lead and the choices we make to strengthen liberalism and oppose the slide to authoritarianism? Well, I'm, I'm, that's a that's a terrific question, and and I it's it, I'm glad that question is raised because I do think that, you know. There has been a long tendency uh, in the United States to say, for instance, our institutions will protect us. Uh, you know, the checks and balances, Congress, et cetera. Um, or when we get a new president, everything will be fine. The president will fix it. Um, and I think that we need to remember that institutions don't work unless people are demanding that they work. There, there's nothing automatic in our system that saves us from uh, democracy collapsing. It requires our efforts, uh, everybody's efforts. And I would say um, now more than ever, we need, every individual in this country needs to be an activist mm -hmm. and needs to be uh, a demander of their politicians, uh, outspoken in, in what is now a wide open media environment. There's a lot of ways for people to express themselves without using nasty words. Um, and in term, also in terms of talking to their children and in demanding a, a good educational system. I really think that it's, it's always been true, but it's more true than ever that individuals now really matter in a, uh, in, if we're going to sort of save what it is that we've created. Mm. <clears throat> well, thank you. Um, I'd like to thank Brookings for sharing Bob with us and <laughs> General Allen uh, and you for the great article and all three of you for what I think we can all agree was really a great panel. So thank you very much. Okay. And thank you all for coming.